Hello, and welcome to our podcast, Archetypes in Numbers. This is another one in our series where we are discussing the various archetypes that you might find throughout literature. And in this case, we wanted to focus on the use of numbers in some stories. So the more and more you read and the more and more background knowledge you gather, you will probably see more and more patterns of how numbers are used. You could probably look at almost any text and see some kind of a number represented in there. But it seems to us that some numbers are more important than others in that they recur more often. They show up in more texts. They are used across different cultures, time periods, etc. And so to us, that really demonstrates the essence of the archetype, a universal symbol that crosses time periods, it crosses genres, crosses cultures, etc. And so the numbers that we wanted to look at here to kind of prove that they are archetypes are 3, 7, and 40. It seems like these numbers come up a lot over and over again. So if you are reading fiction and you happen to come across one of these numbers, it's probably not random that they've chosen to have the number three, for instance, in terms of the numbers of heroes in a story. Or perhaps the journey lasting seven days isn't random either. The point is that many of these numbers are archetypes. You see them repeated over and over throughout time, culture, and different genres. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of how these numbers show up in literature and text. So the number three comes up a lot in many different cultures' literatures. And I know many of us are studying literature from a Western perspective, so Western Europe, North America. And so by default, we are probably looking at this from a Christian point of view because that tends to be the book that many of the authors of pieces have studied. So here in the West, if Christianity is the predominant religion, most likely authors of some of the classic stories we've read were probably well-schooled in Christianity. And so a lot of that probably pervaded a lot of what they were writing. But the beauty of an archetype is that it's not bound by one religion or one culture or one part of the world. We will be able to show you examples of how these numbers, and especially the number three, pervade literature from around the world. But if we're looking at some examples here from the number three, we can see some examples directly from Christianity. The idea of the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all acting as one. But again, we have three. Good Friday to Easter is three days. Pretty famous story where Peter denies knowing Jesus three times on the eve of Jesus' crucifixion. Why not four? Why not two? Again, we get that archetype of three. There's just something about that number that satisfies us universally as humans. We like that number. There seems to be some balance. And that is kind of what all of these archetypes do. They just feel satisfactory to humanity. Another set of three examples come from Dante, so Italian Renaissance literature. Most specifically, we could look at Dante's Inferno, which was one-third of his series, where we have Inferno, which was the trip through hell, Purgatorio, and then eventually Paradiso, where heaven is attained. So right away, you can see that the Inferno is one-third of his whole series. Once you start to examine how that piece was written, you're going to see that it's written in Terza Rima, stanzas of three lines. There are 99 cantos in each, which is a nice multiple of three. Eventually, when we get down to the ninth circle of hell in the Inferno, we meet Satan. He has three heads, three mouths, and three sets of wings. Again, that archetypal number of three. And in all of the mouths, Satan is chewing one of the great traitors to their lords. And in this case, Brutus, Cassius, who betrayed Julius Caesar, and then Judas, who betrayed Jesus. But again, many multiples of three throughout that entire piece. So if we were to study Hinduism, we would also see that their major gods are also in a set of three, Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. If we look at Greek mythology, we have many, many sets of three, but here's an example of that. The three Gorgons of Greek mythology are a group of three. And if you're not sure who the Gorgons were or are, think about the story of Medusa, the one that had snakes for hair, and Perseus had to come in and kill her using his shield as a mirror. But the point is, Medusa was one of three. 
We have the three fates, and in this case we get a still from the movie Hercules from Disney, but again, they're staying true to the archetype of three. The heads on Cerberus, who is the guard dog to Hades, there are three of those. And in the bottom right you see a still from the Harry Potter series, where in the very first one we have the guard dog of Fluffy, who is guarding the area where the Sorcerer's Stone is kept. Perhaps that's supposed to be a direct reference to Cerberus, but at the very least they made a three-headed dog. Not four, not two, but three. If we wanted to study architecture, we could see groups of three. These are the various orders of columns. On the left, we have the very plain Doric column, and these would be on the very bottom layer of some piece of architecture. As you move up in fanciness and also up in height, you might have the Ionic column, and then finally, you'd have the most fancy Corinthian. Again, three different types. We have three primary colors. We see a ton of sets of three throughout nursery rhymes. And so here we are breaking, obviously, from the Christian tradition of three, or the Hindu tradition of three, and we're just having them in popular culture. Three little pigs, three blind mice, three billy goats gruff, and Goldilocks and the three bears. If we look at popular movies, we have groups of three oftentimes. In the very funny movie with Billy Crystal, we have three of the city slickers, three city guys who go out to a dude ranch to kind of find themselves. But again, it's a group of three. The Three Amigos with Steve Martin, Ghostbusters, another set of three, and granted, the Ghostbusters do get a fourth Ghostbuster that helps them out eventually, but they start off with three. And then more recently in young adult literature, we have examples like the Percy Jackson Trio and the Harry Potter Trio. Yes, it's very much focused on Harry Potter, but he always has two sidekicks, and so these three are always working together. Another number that serves as an archetype in literature is that of seven. And so again, we can go back to its ties to Christianity. In Christianity, there are seven deadly sins. You can see those listed there. There are also seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, all the things that a Christian could earn or do throughout their life in terms of living a Christian life, becoming baptized, becoming married, perhaps uh, receiving holy orders, so becoming a priest, confession, confirmation, etc. But then again, we see ties to popular culture. The seven dwarfs and Snow White. Why seven? Why not eight? Why not six? There's something about seven that just feels complete. Japanese film, we have seven samurai. A group of seven independent samurai come to help save a town. And this was remade into the movie The Magnificent Seven. Again, not The Magnificent Six or The Magnificent Eight, but for some reason, seven just felt right. Also going back to the Harry Potter series, which has a lot of Christian elements in it, so it does demonstrate a lot of overlaps with the numbers three and seven. Here's an example of how it overlaps with seven. The seven horcruxes that Harry needs to find are in a group of seven. The ring, locket, cup, Harry Potter himself, not to give anything away, you know, figure there's a couple year limit on spoilers here. Nagini the snake, the diary, and the diadem. Why did J.K. Rowling divide up Voldemort's soul into seven? Hard to say, but it is an archetypal number. It just feels right, it feels round, and that it is seven. We can also see examples from Islam. It says the seven heavens and the earth and all that is therein glorify him, meaning God. So we have a group of seven again. Greek mythology, we have the seven sisters or the Pleiades, and this is the basis for the Subaru logo. So if you happen to see one of those cars driving around your area, check that out. The seven stars or the seven sisters are supposed to be what that logo is based on. And then additionally, Egyptian mythology. Set tore the god Osiris' body into 14 pieces, seven each for the two regions of Upper and Lower Egypt. And so Osiris was the first mummy or first mummified figure in Egyptian history, and that kind of spurs the tradition of mummifying people after they died in Egypt. But you can see from their mythology, you get the nice archetypal number of seven. And again, in pop culture, we continue to have bunches of sevens. We have seven colors in the rainbow, Roy G. Biv. 
seven notes in the musical scales, seven dwarfs again, seven continents, seven wonders of the ancient or the modern world, seven days of the week, the musical seven brides for seven brothers. We could go on, but of course the most important group of seven were the seven castaways from Gilligan's Island. Gilligan, Skipper, Professor, etc. Why not eight? Why not six? Hard to know exactly, but again, the TV show creators settled on the number seven, because something about seven just felt universal felt complete for those creators. One last archetypal number we'd want to look at is the number 40. Again, this seems to come up in a lot of different cultures and religions and time periods in different genres. So again, we can back up to start with Christianity. We see the number 40 repeating itself a lot of times in the Bible. Jesus roams the wilderness for 40 days after Jesus returned to earth after visiting hell and then left earth a second time. It's 40 days to reach heaven and then the Israelites roam the desert for 40 years. So again, starting us off with some archetypal 40s. Noah and the flood, 40 days, 40 nights. Moses stays with God on the mountain after the Ten Commandments for 40 days, 40 nights. And then Lent, the celebratory season leading up to Easter, is 40 days. Again, why not 39? Why not 42? Why exactly 40? Again, that number seems to feel complete and satisfactory to humans universally. And then just to show that this is not just a Christian number in our literature, this is pervasive of many cultures. We have Mesopotamia. They celebrated 40 days after the Pleiades disappeared under the horizon, kind of connecting the seven with the 40. Babylonia, there was a creation myth where we had Marduk defeating Tiamat and 39 monsters. And if you add those all together, that makes 40. We also have Alibaba having 40 thieves. And so we get the Persian influence there. And then the current day references, we have the 40 hour work week. So that's about all we wanted to talk about in this podcast in terms of more archetypes. And in this case, the numbers. So as you continue to read and gather background knowledge through all the texts that you read, see, view, etc., look for these numbers. Look for threes, sevens, and forties, and I think you'll see that they pop up more often than not. And again, since they are archetypal, they show up across time, so old pieces, new pieces. They show up across culture, so that could be Western-based, that could be Eastern-based, so maybe something from Asia, India, Japan, etc. And they also show up across the genre, so we're going to see these in science fiction, historical pieces, whatever. So again, take this information, file it away, keep your eyes open, your radars open for all of these different archetypes, and see if you can see a couple more of these numbers the next time you read a piece. As always, thanks so much for listening. If you have any questions, please bring those into class, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.